Hi, Diana. Hello, Frank. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Same. Uh, hi, Bill. Nice to see you again. <laughs> it's like being a, it's like being in a, you know, in a house or something. You you welcome your guest, and it's you know seven p.m. here. It's pretty much time for for a drink. But anyway, um, it, it's really amazing to have you you both um, talking to me tonight because um, so we've uh, we've heard the um, cases uh, the case of, of South Africa versus Israel at the International Court of Justice. Um, on the 11th, uh, South Africa presented its case. On the 12th, Israel uh, responded, presented its case. And uh, you are both very, very knowledgeable about the ICJ. Diana, you were part of the Palestinian team in 2004 for the advisory opinion on the uh, separation apartheid wall. Uh, and, and Bill, you were the counsel for Serbia in 2014 versus Croatia and the council for Myanmar versus Gambia in 2019, 2020, because the, the result was early 2020. So um, to start with, I wanted to ask you both. I mean, Diana and I, we've been, we talked after the South Africa presentation. So maybe I'll start with you, Bill. I wanted to ask you a very simple, simple question. What did you? What are your thoughts on the hearings, day one and day two, uh, South Africa and, and Israel? Well, I think that the South African team presented a very compelling case. It was very impressive, and uh, you know, top marks to them. Um, I think that Israel's uh, effort was mediocre. Uh, I, you know, just to be as I, I, you'll, you'll resent the idea if I say to be sim sympathetic or fair to them, but it's a hard case to fight off. Um, it, it's relatively straightforward obtaining provisional measures. Of course, it all depends on what the provisional measures are, but I think it's it was a foregone conclusion before the hearing started that provisional measures were likely in this case, uh, given just the facts and given the submission, the written submission by South Africa. So that being said, I my impression is that the team for Israel realized that they didn't really have much of a chance and didn't really try and fight off the application in a serious way, but rather made a mixture of, you know, um, going over issues which are largely irrelevant, like the uh, the the events of the 7th of October um, and trying to argue in vain. I mean, one of the things that was interesting about their conduct was their attempt to distance themselves from some of the most outrageous statements that have been made um, and that South Africa demonstrated, the ones that are, are um, clearly evidence of genocidal intent, at least by those who made them. And uh, so I found that to be striking. And I thought it was kind of careless in many respects as well, um, Malcolm Shaw, who is a senior international lawyer, made, you know, quite a gratuitous comment about South Africa and other states saying they were they were accomplices to genocide because they had in some way endorsed uh, the attack on the 7th of, of October. So whether or not they endorsed it, I don't know. There's no evidence that I'm aware of that they did that. But even if they did, you don't become an accomplice by endorsing something that someone's done. To be an accomplice, you have to contribute to the crime being committed. And there's absolutely no evidence, and they didn't suggest it, that anybody had been in on the uh, plans for the attack on the 7th of October. This was just a legally careless and irresponsible. Um, and so I found that all to be quite, quite disappointing. If I were them, I would have fought harder about the actual measures and talked about the measures that should be imposed. Uh, but that would involve acknowledging that there would be measures uh, to be imposed. And perhaps that was something they didn't really want to, to fight about. But but they, they gave that a very small part of their case. So, you know, if these were two Jessup teams appearing before me, you know what a Jessup moot is. This is an exercise that international law students go through, I give the South African team, you know, an A, 
and I'd give Israel maybe maybe a C minus because I don't like to fail people, but certainly South Africa outperformed the the Israeli team. Can I just quickly follow up with you, Bill? I want to I want to come I want to let Diana respond, but then follow up on the the likeliness of the likelihood of the provision um, PMs. Um, but even for non-lawyer, non-legal specialist uh, like myself and like many others around the world, watching Israel's defense was in, in, pretty much pretty incredible because they kept going back to October the 7th, uh, saying, but this happened. But I kept th thinking to myself, yeah, obviously this happened, but you're committing a genocide. You're not answering the question, you know. And then, oh, but it's a war. Yes, but you're committing a genocide, you know. And so they kept avoiding sort of the elephant in the room and not responding to anything regarding the fact that South Africa presented. And I thought this was also careless because I thought you, you, you are in the highest legal court in the world, at least respect it. And I thought this was really like a disrespectful defense, no? Yeah, maybe they're, to the extent they're used to uh, arguing cases in court, they probably are used to uh, soft treatment by the judges. That's, that's maybe what they're used to. And they don't realize that they're up there before 15 of the sharpest minds in international law, uh, people of principle, from around the world, and they don't have a lot of patience for this kind of stuff. They sit politely, of course, and they behave in the most dignified manner. But I, I doubt that that the, I doubt that most of the pleading by South Africa by by Israel um, had any significant impact on the judges of the court. Diana, we we spoke about South Africa's case and presentation, but I mean, you can go back to it if you want. Uh, so what were your thoughts about the whole hearings, maybe focusing a bit more about Israel? Because again, we spoke about South Africa before. Um, thank you, Frank. And and thank you, Bill, for, uh, for being on side with me. This is lovely. I, I can't agree more with Bill. I, I think it was incredible to watch, uh, particularly because for me, it felt as though we were watching a, a presentation that they would perhaps be giving to um, some diplomats, perhaps to some media folks, but not at all a legal case. And 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 for me, uh, just building upon what, what Bill said, this was very much like watching the way the state behaves if you're watching a hearing inside an Israeli court. And the reason I say this is because in an Israeli court, the Israeli courts give a lot of leeway to these ideas of military necessity. Um, and they give a lot of leeway to whenever the government says that they need to do something. And so this presentation was very much focused on October 7th and what happened on October 7th and then the rest of the case was, to sum it up, a trust us type of type of uh, submission. Uh, trust what, what we're saying, trust what we're doing. One thing that was also very interesting uh, that struck me is that in the, the South African submissions, a lot of the statements that they made and the assertions that they were making were backed up, not by Palestinians, even though we really should be trusting Palestinians, but they were backed up by statements from people who are representatives of international organizations, whether it was the um, uh, UNRWA or the World, World Food Program or OCHA um, or the Secretary General. Those were the statements that, that South Africa was relying on to show and to demonstrate that uh, exactly what Israel is doing and the genocide that is perpetrating. Whereas for the Israelis, it was mostly trust us, listen to what the Minister of Defense said, it, even though he was the same person who made these genocidal statements, listen to what the head of COGAD is saying, even though he was another person who made genocidal statements, and really attempting to downplay the words um, and statements of, of, of very high level officials, including as we've talked about before, the president of the country, 
uh, the prime minister who's repeatedly made genocidal statements, the minister of defense, and of course, um, uh, people who are even lower down the chain uh, and a number of different ministers. So for me, it uh, it was really, um, I felt as though they were, they thought that they were once again in front of a set of, of Israeli judges in an Israeli court and at best directing their message in a form of, um, to, of media, to diplomats, to journalists, but really no legal case to stand on. So my next question is, um, how long do you think, like from past experience, is there like we're going to have to wait for a decision on the P PMs, provisional measures? I don't know, like Bill, maybe you want to start? Sure. Um, well, I, I give it two to three weeks. In the Ukraine case, it took them a week to issue provisional measures. But uh, in the um, Myanmar case, it took longer but there was a long christmas break in between and there was no ongoing conflict either uh they've 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 issued these uh provisional measures in cases where um there's not really a a, a, a very sharp sense of urgency i think the same thing in recently in the case that canada and the netherlands took against uh, syria under the torture convention whereas here you know they uh, every day something tragic and terrible is happening in Gaza. So I think this is an, an impetus to them to to move quickly on this uh, on this matter. The other thing is that there's a turnover of judges in about three weeks time and there will there will definitely be a lot of uh, uh, a, a lot of pressure on them to try and get everything wrapped up for when the new judges come in and and the the, the outgoing judges finish their terms. Um, there are five of them who are, who are whose terms are finishing, and um, they have three pending matters before them that, that need to be resolved. So I expect all of those we're going to get rulings on, including the provisional measures. Um, the provisional measures judgments um, typically are not very long and complicated either. They can be, I mean, they're, they're, it, it's the judges reach their opinion, but there's not a lot of nuance that has to be added to them either not that it's a superficial exercise but it's not it's not like some of those judgments that are 200 pages long and have uh several dissenting or individual or separate opinions associated with them with them either so yeah two to three weeks tops diana do you like agree do you want to add something oh, yeah yeah it's uh it's so the Five judges, or it's supposed to be five judges who are leaving on February 6th. I think the Australian judge is returning. So it's just going to be right. four judges who are leaving. And yes, I, I agree. I think it's it will be um it, it'll be a short turnaround. I hope it's a short turnaround. I pray it's a short turnaround. Uh, because really Gaza can't sustain more than this. Already today, just so that you get a sense, um, it's the weather here is cold, it's rainy. And when you have so many people, 85% um, of Palestinians who've been displaced and hundreds of thousands of them in, um, in places that 1.8 million are not in their homes and hundreds of thousands of them are, are in tents uh, in the southern part of the Gaza Strip, you can see that the rain coupled with the lack of food, coupled with the lack of medicine, coupled with lack of fuel, we fully expect that di disease is going to spread very quickly. So I really hope that it's the sooner uh, rather than the sooner, the better. So so now the, the, the question I have for you is, um, how do you think this will go? How do you think this is going to, you know, like the decision? Bill, you said something interesting a few minutes ago. You said that actually provisional measures are not hard to get usually right um and i think we're gonna have uh, there's going to be a follow-up question to this is like what type of provisional measures are we going to get um uh, is it depending on if, if there's like you know 12 judges against two if, the, if it's like very close so first like how do you think this is going to go and actually you maybe can get into the the numbers do you think it's going to be a tight 
one? Do you think it could be actually quite fav favorable to th South Africa, uh, Bill? I can't begin to speculate on that, how the, how the court will, will go on that. There, there is a phenomenon that I think one of the judges, I think uh, the late Thomas Bergendahl, who was a judge at the court for many years, um, uh, Bergendahl said that um, he talked about what he called feel-good uh, provisional measures. And this is where the court orders the states to respect the law and things like this. You know, I used to practice law. Uh, I, I practiced law in Canada for many years. And if we we would get provisional measures type orders in things like family cases where you had a you know a, a violent uh, husband and a woman was in a shelter and you needed some kind of a provisional order and it was without prejudice to the merits um, and it had to be done urgently but you wouldn't go into court and ask the judge say order that man not to beat his wife because the judge would say well i don't make such an order because it's against the law anyway we don't need a provisional order to order people to do things that they that that they aren't allowed to do anyway. And so typically in a court like the European Court of Human Rights, you get a provisional measures order against a state or against, yeah, against the state uh, not to do something that it can otherwise do, like extradite someone to a country where they'd be subject to the death penalty. But at the International Court of Justice, they'll also make these sort of feel-good orders where they'll order you to not to commit genocide. Um, this is what they did in the Myanmar case, basically. And uh, then the state can turn around smugly and say, well, we're not committing it anyway, so um, big deal. It's not a not really an order, it doesn't affect us. But it does affect them, actually. Even those quite symbolic orders um, are, are viewed globally out in the court of public opinion in the world as being an order against the state. And uh, obviously, one of the peculiarities of this case as well, with a provisional measures order, often in, in there was a reference to the provisional measures orders in the old Bosnia cases at the International Court of Justice. But there you had two states involved in a conflict. And so the court would make orders against both of them ordering them. And, and South Africa's requested this in a kind of a polite way where they order both sides not to do anything to aggravate the dispute between them. But the, um, the, the in, in basically, they can't order South Africa to do anything because South Africa is not actually uh, a party to the, to the real conflict, which is the conflict in Gaza. And they can't order anything against Palestine because it's not a party to the litigation. So this is the curious part of it, where you have you have a conflict going on, but the two sides are not they're not both of them are not represented in the in the legal battle. Only one of them is there. So this is a, it's just a peculiarity of the of the case, and and I don't know how that would be addressed in the final measures, but but certainly measures against Israel will be viewed as a defeat for Israel and a victory for South Africa and for Palestine, even if they are more in the nature of the feel-good orders like don't commit genocide and so on. But the core of it, which I think is is, is the most important, are the orders relating to uh, allowing or, or not obstructing uh, access to food, water, uh, medication, and, and so on. This is really absolutely fundamental. The ultimate would be an order to stop all military activity, um, and and that'll be the you know if they get that one, then that's the they've 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 won. That would be total victory. But if they don't get that one, they, we still need the one about access to uh, unimpeded access to all of the um, necessities of life. And I would think that's a very that's a strong case and one that they're very likely to get. Perhaps judges will split on what those issues are. It's it's harder to argue uh, against uh, for, for the measures about stopping all military activity because of the self-defense arg argument and that they need to use military force and so on. And hard to tailor that other than in order to respect international humanitarian law, which, as you know, Israel will insist that since they're the most humanitarian army in the world, they always respect humanitarian law. We know that not to be 
exactly true, but you know they'll respond to it that way. But an order about food, water, medicine, fuel, and so on, it's pretty hard to reject that, actually, I would think, or to claim that they shouldn't order that. Um, just one other element about this. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm even following your question now or if I've got off the track. But uh, the prime minister yesterday made a statement, or today, it was, he was quoted today, saying, we won't let the International Court of Justice stop us. And uh, this is not, you know, as as a, just speaking as a litigator who's appeared before the International Court of Justice, you really don't want your government saying we don't care what the what the court says. You come before the court, and as you should, full of deference for the court because this is it's not only international law, but it's even more sacred than that. This is. This is the body that's charged by the Charter of the United Nations with resolving disputes between states so that they don't pick up arms. And um, it's not a good look for a state to say, we don't care what what the International Court of Justice says. I, I expect that some of the lawyers in the Israeli ministry are, you know, scratching their heads saying, I wish he'd shut up. But... But there you go. That's that's the prime minister of the country saying that. I, I think one other thought about this, that, that even if, and everyone says, will Israel respect the order? That may be your next question. What will what will Israel do? Will they respect it? Um, and uh, if they're, to the extent to which they're defiant, whatever the order is, and dismissive of the order, is going to be, uh, create a lot of discomfort with countries that are normally pretty, loyal to them, like I'm thinking of Germany, Canada, some of the others who made, by the way, really stupid statements recently in the last few days saying, well, we agree with, we don't agree with South the premise of South Africa's case or something. They shouldn't do this with a case that's before the courts. They sh That's also a lack of respect for the court for them to do this. And, you know, there's this idea that Germany says they're going to intervene in support of uh, of Israel in the case, they don't even understand what the statute of the court says. The statute of the court says that you can intervene about a question of interpretation of the Genocide Convention. You can't intervene because you support the factual uh, arguments of one of the states in the litigation. That's not allowed by the statute of the International Court of Justice. You know, I think maybe the president of Namibia issued a statement you know, Germany should be careful when they get into denying genocide. You know, it's not a good, not a good image for them given their history. I wish they'd keep quiet. Diana, any thoughts? I, I agree. Yeah, look, I think the the Israelis, um, Netanyahu is saying that he's not going to abide by the ICJ for a reason, and that's because his political life depends upon the continuation of the attack on Gaza. And uh, and everybody knows that. Just over the over the weekend, there was a very large protest in Tel Aviv uh, against the government and 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 against the, the the conduct of the government and against the fact that this government still exists. And so he knows that his days are limited and he needs to continue um, this attack on Gaza in order to remain in office. As long as there is an attack on Gaza, then he will remain in office. The minute that it ends, he's out of office. He knows this. But beyond that, the, the bigger question is not just what Israel is going to do, but what other countries are going to do as well. Is the United States going to continue to support Israel? Are they going to continue to send weapons? Because, you know, this isn't just been an Israeli attack on Gaza. It's been an Israeli attack with US weaponry, with a lot of US funding and US troops. And the question becomes whether they are also going to continue if there are provisional measures and whether other countries are going to continue as well. Another part of this, uh, as Bill uh, already mentioned, is that it's not a good look. And and this, um, if, if Israel's defiant, it actually uh, bolsters the entire BDS movement, because the whole BDS movement uh, was there was a there was a, obviously there was a BDS movement that existed in the 90s with the first Intifada, 
But the BDS movement as we know it now was revived in 2005 in the aftermath of the ICJ uh, opinion, advisory opinion. We saw that countries around the world were not doing anything to stop Israel. Israel wasn't stopping and countries around the world weren't doing anything to stop. So if Israel remains defiant, again, it just bolsters the, the, the BDS movement. And once again, not a good look. So whether Israel abides or doesn't, the, the sum total is that although Palestinians pay the price, Israel's also going to be paying a price. Israel's also going to be paying a price. And it's paying a price with this um, idea of legitimacy that they've so, so been desperate for since 1948. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so now into like the nitty gritty, in fact. So um, whatever the, let's say the provisional measures are, you know, voted for, whatever they are, we know that um, the ICJ, it's a binding decision, which means Israel has to respect it, but there's no practical enforcement of the binding decision. So the ICJ cannot send an army to Israel uh, for them to allow trucks uh, to go into Gaza. So uh, then we go into the what you started to mention, Diana, the duties of, of states uh, flowing from the order. So like in, in a way, like legally, Bill, what are they? You know, if the PMs are, vo are voted um, and Israel doesn't respect them, uh, the court cannot enforce them. But what what is the the duty, the legal obligation of other states, if there is any. I think it, we're in the realm of the political at that point. There are some potential consequences that are they're difficult to measure in all kinds of areas for Israel uh, in violating an order uh, of the court, but they wouldn't be the first country to do it either. Um, and uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, this is not like uh, a, a judgment of the Supreme Court in a country that, that changes the that changes the thermostat completely in the country on some particular issue, like abortion or whatever. This is this is a, a, a judgment that will be or a decision on, and and we can think further down the line, perhaps to an, eventually a final judgment in the case that still goes back to bilateral relations between Israel and various states, uh, and also to um, the, the the conduct of international organizations. I think that's, you know, there, there are many details and it'll be irregular. Um, we'll see if countries will change their attitude towards Israel if this, uh, if this happens. Again, it will depend on what the measures are and how they are conducted. I think that that, that that's as much as we can say at this point about the about the measures. Um, the the concern for many countries who are very supportive of Israel will be that the rejection of decisions by the court undermines the court, and they appreciate the court, and they need it. But you know, this is also a world that's rife with double standards, and don't ever. Don't ever underestimate the possibility of this all getting bogged down in terrible double standards. We we've seen that. I was I was looking at the thinking of the International Criminal Court, which is another subject where within a few within days of the uh, Russian invasion in 2022, um, various states were 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 laying huge sums of money and resources on the prosecutor to pursue investigations are they doing it here you know are they doing the same thing with with palestine uh by the way for a prosecutor who said he's investigating both sides they're not giving him any money to do it there have been a few little gifts but but nothing comparable it's still just rife with double standards even the appreciation of the destruction the the at the 100 day mark in Ukraine, according to the UN monitoring mission there, there were 5,000 civilians who had been killed. 5,000 civilians, including a number of children, but we were talking in the hundreds of children. Not at all comparable to what we see in Palestine. 
Not nothing close to it. And remember that the population of Ukraine is 20 times that of Gaza. So just a completely a different order of magnitude altogether. Do you remember two years ago how the, the Western newspapers were howling in outrage about war crimes being committed by the Russians in Ukraine? And what do we see now? You know, silence or this little meaningless mantra about, well, but Israel has a right to self-defense. Israel, has, I, I heard the minister of uh, defense in the UK on the radio this morning and he was he was kind of cornered by the by the announcer who was reading to him the statements uh, of uh, the statements that the South Africans read out in court on Thursday, the genocidal incitement type statements like Gaza should be crushed, shouldn't exist, we'll destroy everything there, and he just kept saying, yeah, well, yeah, I guess it's unfortunate the wording, but Israel has a right to self defense, and they just returned to that mantra. It's such a different message than what they were spewing out two years ago when it was Russia and Ukraine. So there's there's a huge amount of double standards, and I can't either rule out the fact that it won't infect, to some extent, the ruling of the International Court of Justice and the proceedings there. Diana, look, obviously feel free to add something, but then I'll, I'll already ask you the, the next question, because we, we've touched on it a bit. I was wondering what could uh, the um, the judgment of this case, what kind of impact it could have on the Center for Constitutional Rights case versus Joe Biden for failure to prevent the genocide in Gaza. Joe Biden, I think it was yesterday, uh, marking the 100th day of the war, as they called it, in his statement didn't mention the Palestinians didn't mention the more than 25,000 dead, didn't mention the 85% of the population displaced. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I have no words, but so feel free to um, comment on Bill's point and then give us your thought on that. On that. This, is, this is exactly the issue is that, and, and I think I said this to you, Frank, when we spoke last time, this isn't just a question of South Africa versus Israel. It's not just a question of Palestinians and Israel. This isn't just this isn't just South Africa versus Israel. It's not just Palestinians and Israel. What is being spotlighted here is the international legal system as we know it. And there's one of two tracks that it can go down. It can go down the, the track of being a legal system with, with all of its problems. You know, le law is never, uh, it's never formed in a vacuum. There are power interests that are involved. I, we can't be oblivious to that. But at the same time, there are a set of principles that supposedly all states are supposed to adhere to. It's either going to go down that path or it's gonna go down the path of relying on power and power politics. And it's one of the two that the court is going to have to choose. Is it going to choose the legal path with, with as, as problematic as that is, or is it gonna choose the power path? Th those are the two paths that, that uh, the court needs to choose. And this is not just a spotlight on, again, South Africa, Israel, Palestine, Israel, it's also spotlighting all of the, the people, all the countries who've said nothing or who haven't stopped the genocide over the course of the past hundred days. And I would encourage people if they if they have the time to read um, this wonderful piece by Nimr Sultani in The Guardian. It, I think it came out on, um, on, on Friday night. Um, which, which which really highlights this very issue about about how this isn't just about South Africa or just about Israel, but it's about all of the people who have allowed this genocide to continue. Now, how does it impact the, the case in the United States? Again, one of the things that's amazing is that even if we get this decision of provisional measures, an order of provisional measures, and uh, Israel ignores it, which they said that they will, it again opens up the doors for other claims in, in other countries. 
Now, again, it's important to bear in mind that legal systems are fraught with power. They're they're not, you know, there's not there's nothing perfect about them. Uh, but once again, it's just yet another avenue to to tear away at this idea of legitimacy and to highlight the the role that the United States, in particular, this president, is playing when it comes to this genocide. This isn't just uh, Israel against Palestinians. This is an Israeli attack on Palestinians that is funded and supported by the United States. Bill, any extra thoughts on, on how could this impact the CCR case versus Biden in the US? I can't really estimate that. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm involved in that case because I prepared a, a legal opinion that was submitted with the original application back in October um, about the, the, the duty or the obligation under the Genocide Convention on the United States to act to prevent genocide. I know that there's an there's an oral hearing that's scheduled for the end of the month, um, and beyond that, I don't really know, and I, I I don't know enough about American law to assess the chances or anything. It's another piece. It's another it's another battle in this fight. That's all, and uh, I hope that it goes well. And certainly, uh, a negative outcome for South Africa will not be helpful. But uh, as I say, I'm quite optimistic and positive that, that that will take place and that will energize um, other initiatives, not just in the United States, but in other countries as well, where there's litigation going on about all kinds of issues. There's a, a case I know of in Canada where they're trying to get the um, a government body to to divest itself of investments in, uh, in Palestine. Uh, in 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 settler controlled, I don't I don't remember the details exactly, but I, I can check them. So so there are all, all kinds of areas where that's going to uh, have an impact. I think one other very I mean I'm at a, a university where everybody gets nervous when you say you're going to talk about Palestine and Gaza. Um, you know we proclaim our universities as being havens of free speech and reflection and everything, but it's a terrible environment these days where they're all saying, you know, well, but you have to be balanced and it might be anti-Semitism and all of this. Um, and a victory at the International Court of Justice is going to it's going to help that, you know, as well. There are many places it will it will it will be helpful. It will legitimize the criticism and, and, and uh, of Israel and and make it. Uh, yeah, they're, they're just all of this is going to be helpful to the case and kudos to South Africa for 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 taking this initiative you know they have a great history South Africa at the International Court of Justice you know they go back to the the first advisory opinions on Namibia and then they had a they had a really bad uh result in the middle of the 1960s and that got reversed but the history of the International Court of Justice there's no South Africa you could write volumes just about its experience there and this is the latest chapter um but but so far it's it's wonderful so far so good uh we're gonna wrap up I'm, i've got a final question for you both and diana you've you've touched upon it um tony caron wrote in the nation today an article titled titled the south africa case is not only challenging israel it is trying to break the spell of u.s hegemony and I think that's what you touched upon, Diana. Um, so would you agree with that? Because for me, it is. It's, it's a moment. We see who is backing South Africa now. And it's all like, you know, countries from the global south. And you see who is backing Israel quite openly. It's mostly Western former colonial powers. So is it like a moment where it's, become, it's becoming so clear the, 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 how the world is divided and how countries see the world in a way. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, this genocide has spotlighted so many fault lines and made things so clear for so many people. Look, for, for me, I, I never thought that we would get to the place where it would be 
a hundred days of such brutality. I, I really, it's, if you would ask me a year ago, I, I, um, I don't, th I, I can't say, you know, intellectually you can say yes, but in my heart, I, I, um, I think I would have had a hard time. Not because of that Israel hasn't done um, these sorts of things in the past, but because I, 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 I think that at a certain point, people believe that there will be somebody to step in, that countries around the world are going to say enough. And in the first few weeks, it became apparent that that many of these countries that you've just named were, were have not been saying that it's enough, quite the opposite. They keep giving Israel cover and they keep letting Israel do whatever it wants to do. And that is the very scary part of this. Um, you know, I personally, we talked about this on our first discussion, thank, thank South Africa, because without this intervention by South Africa, there would be absolutely no hope for Israel to end this, um, except when it tires of bombing Palestinians, really. It doesn't seem that the U.S. is giving Israel a red light. It gave it the greenest of green lights at the beginning. And as much as we can hear about statements that they're tiring of Israel or that there's a, a dispute with Israel on the ground for Palestinians, we're paying with our lives. Um, and so I really thank South Africa for at least having the, the courage to stand up at least trying to do what they can to stop Israel and and for continuing again to highlight exactly what kind of world we live in. There are countries that are very much in favor of genocide and there are countries who are opposed. Bill, I'll give you the, the final words. I think it's a good way to end with Diana's comments. I don't have anything to add. I totally agree. Okay. So uh, thanks again to you both. Uh, this was um, so interesting. And um, we are a few weeks, maybe, uh, maybe even, you know, it could even come quicker um, to, to see if um, what's going to happen and where the international legal world stand and where the world stand. And uh, if we can still believe in, in the law and in justice, uh, you know, so um and and i think as as you've both both said it's um i mean even if it sounds bad even i mean it's a it's a big it'll be a big pr victory for the global solidarity movement it's all it already is you know and um, um and we hope for more than a pr victory obviously but um israel as um has based everything it does about being this little state, you know, fighting for survival. And this is the one of the myth of Israel being completely debunked by this case. So, um, so again, thank you both. Um, and um, yeah, we'll speak soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank bye. you. Good evening.